people in, uh, in developed nations uh, and only 10 per 100,000 in developing nations. Right, so in terms of uh, IBD, um, this was noted from way back uh, pre-1859, uh, uh, and it was noted that the incidence actually increased as people were becoming more westernized. And the numbers went very steeply high uh, after the Industrial Revolution. And that pattern hasn't changed. Uh, you can see that uh, the first case of ulcerative colitis was reported in China in 1956, and thereafter, uh, in newly industrialized uh, countries, the incidence has increased uh, rapidly. And so if you consider Africa, most of us are developed, uh, developing and are newly industrialized uh, countries with changes in diet, in lifestyle, in where we are, you know, from rural areas to urbanization. Uh, but also, I think over time, the ability for us to recognize this disease, to diagnose it endoscopically, histopathologically has also increased. So as a result, the numbers of, of disease uh, and new cases that are being reported will in effect uh, go up as well. So there's multiple factors why there is uh, increasing incidence uh, uh, in uh, newly industrialized countries. So Chris had a conversation with uh, Professor Watermeyer, who's the first author of this paper uh, in 2018, uh, wondering what the status of uh, IBD in Sub-Saharan Africa was. And in fact, there was no data that was written up. And so Jill sought then to do a systematic review uh, of uh, IBD in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then eventually co-authored this paper where she describes uh, the epidemiology of IBD. And eff effectively what she found, which is represented in this slide, is that apart from South Africa, there were only a total of 210 cases reported in the literature. So with some countries reporting a mere single case, uh, some of them about 10 cases or so, 13, and then with a few countries uh, uh, reporting more than uh, 19 cases. So in this instance, Nigeria was the country that reported most of the, of the cases. Now, this is all outside of uh, South Africa. In South Africa, we do see a lot of, of patients. We are diagnosing a lot of patients uh, daily, particularly, I guess, in the tertiary centers. And in our own clinic, we have at least 300,000 uh, cases of IBD in our records, and we get referred new patients uh, every week. And so at the time, this data suggested that actually there was a lot of under-reporting, um, under-diagnosis, and that probably this was also related to the um, inability or unavailability of the resources uh, for diagnosing uh, these patients and picking them up. So this was published in the SMJ uh, in 2020. So I haven't updated the slide, but you can see, as I've said, that uh, in our clinic, uh, obviously there's referral bias because we're a tertiary center that specializes in IBD, but there's no doubt that uh, we diagnose uh, new cases of IBD all the time in young patients, and we are even seeing elderly patients uh, with a new diagnosis of IBD. And so, 2020, so subsequent to Jill's uh, original publication in 2019, there was another uh, review that was done by Phoebe Hodges. Phoebe is, uh, is a PhD candidate and she's based uh, in Zambia. And as part of her PhD work, she set up a registry uh, of, of, of uh, IBD, which I'll talk about later. But prior to that, she published this as a literature review, again, reviewing the current state of knowledge uh, and of um, the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease in Sub-Saharan Africa, and effectively found similar findings to what Jill had published in that A, there's under-reporting, B, that there are challenges in terms of resource uh, um, uh, availability, but also in this paper, she does a lot of um, uh, epidemiology, uh, and also she also uh, describes uh, that uh, intestinal TB uh, being a cofactor. Uh, in our setting in terms of uh, diagnosing uh, IBD, which makes it difficult uh, to diagnose, particularly a uh, small bowel um, ileal uh, Crohn's disease. And if one look at, uh, looks at the epidemiological stages of the global uh, evolution of IBD, this has been described in very nice uh, papers uh, by Kaplan G. The first one was uh, in 2021, and then there was a subsequent paper. And I think this nicely explains where we are in terms of the epidemiology of the disease and also to prognosticate what to expect uh, going forward. So he describes the stages as four stages. 
The first stage being the uh, emergence uh, uh, where you have sporadic incident cases that begin to emerge in a population. And obviously for the developed nations, this happened you know, decades ago and for newly industrialized countries, this is what is beginning uh, to happen. Then you have stage two where you have acceleration in incidence. So here you have a dramatic uh, incidence uh, uh, increase in incident cases uh, that are described and observed, but because it's still quite low, the overall prevalence uh, of the condition remains low. Stage three is compounding prevalence, and this is where the incidence rates are stabilizing uh, and may even decline, but the slope of the prevalence continues to accelerate. And this is because um, you have high um, incidence with low mortality. So you still have a population that's alive, that has disease, the prevalence is high, the incidence is low, so you have compounding prevalence with low mortality. And then this is a theoretical stage, stage four, where you'll have equilibrium. So prevalence equilibrium, and this is described as a stage where the slope of the prevalence itself begins to, to level off because the incidence is now stable, but now you have an aging population and then you have a, a higher number of patients uh, that are dying. So this is a nice framework uh, to use in terms of trying to understand um, where the uh, uh, epidemiology is in the different uh, countries based on their level of uh, um, development. And so this is another way of looking at this, where here you can see that in the Western world, and I've shown that in the, um, in the prevalence uh, data, that they are now in the stage of compounding prevalence, where this is now um, leveled off by fewer incident cases and also low mortality rates. For newly industrialized countries or developing countries, you can see that we are either in the acceleration in incidence or the emergence. And I think in, in Africa, we're falling somewhere between emergence and acceleration incidence. I think in South Africa, we are already in the acceleration in incidence. And this has implications for us because we now know that we can expect that over time, we're gonna have a sharp rise uh, in the prevalence. Therefore, we're gonna have a lot of patients that are coming uh, to our service. We're gonna need a a lot of trained uh, gastroenterologists who can make a, a, a firm, a conclusive diagnosis. You're also going to need histopathology services, radiology, and of course, then you're also going to need uh, access uh, to therapy. And then we're also going to start to see uh, complications of disease itself, uh, dysplasia and cancer, but also complications uh, of the therapies that we are giving our patients. So I think we're going to see a burgeoning uh, of, of, of patients uh, with IBD, with, with comorbidities, with in, drug interactions, uh, and, and with complex uh, disease. This is another way, again, to show the data. And here, Kaplan, in, in another paper, does show that we in South Africa are in the acceleration phase, as I've said, whereas the other uh, nations that are developed and have had this disease uh, you know, since the 1950s are now in the phase of compounding uh, prevalence. So, this slide is basically this, my conclusion slide from the talk that I did in 2018, where at the time there wasn't much data. This is before um, the, um, the studies that I'm going to show now. And, and my conclusion was that there was a paucity of data, there was under-reporting, under-diagnosis, and that there were certainly resource uh, challenges in our context. And the way forward, uh, as I suggested at the time, was that we needed to have registries so that we can um, formally um, um, make a note of, of the patients that we are seeing, the epidemiology, the risk factors, and, and what we're seeing. And that there needed to be more uh, education around the diagnosis, recognition, treatment of IBD, so that we can do better uh, for our patients and not treat chronic diarrhea perpetually as infective diarrhea or IBS. Uh, and also that we needed our own data and publication. So this was what I had said and, and, and put forward uh, back when. And I'm quite happy to report that, as Chris said in his intro, that there's been quite a good traction gained uh, since then, in that there have been a couple of things uh, on the move. The first I want to tell you about is the registry. Um, and this registry was, uh, is, is being conducted currently, as we speak, by Phoebe Hodges that I spoke to you about in Zambia. And uh, this data she gave to me uh, towards the end of the year last year. And at this point, she had 33 participants uh, from 12 countries uh, listed there. And her questionnaire sent out to the participants was, have you made a diagnosis of IBD in the last month? And just in just under a year of her study, 
you can see that already there were 158 new cases reported in the registry, which tells you that Jill's original data of the 210 cases described in the, in the literature for, for years and years could not possibly be true. It did in fact reflect uh, that underreporting, uh, which was the conclusion uh, of her study. And in Phoebe's study, you can see that 55% uh, of patients had uh, ulcerative colitis, 37% uh, Crohn's disease, and the remainder had uh, IBD unclassified. Um, there was almost a 50-50 split between men and women. Um, the median age at diagnosis is as we expect, 36 years of old, noting that uh, particularly with Crohn's disease, sometimes the diagnosis can take uh, a longer uh, to, to diagnose. The median time from symptom onset to diagnosis was 12 months. Again, this tends to be more common in Crohn's because ulcerative colitis with bloody diarrhea, mucus, tenesmus, and those symptoms, um, I think is a little bit more typical and easier for people to recognize. 44% of the population uh, are HIV positive. I think that's important because I'm not sure that we know yet uh, how HIV uh, affects the course of IBD and vice versa, how IBD affects the course of HIV and whether there are any implications on the treatments, uh, interactions uh, and, and complications. So I think this is an important thing to note. Um, and then TB history, of course, is important in our context, uh, particularly A as a confounder in diagnosis, but also in um, uh, a complication of TB uh, in patients who are being put on uh, anti-TNFs. Her data further showed that uh, most of the patients had left-sided ulcerative colitis. And in terms of Crohn's disease, although the majority had ileal or ileocecal disease, uh, importantly, 16% of patients had a terrible phenotype uh, with perianal disease. This has huge implications of the therapy because of, of course, the treatment in these patients uh, is biologics. Uh, and in our setting, this is not always available. Uh, and, and, and patients really uh, have poor outcomes and have very, very poor quality of life. You can see that the Crohn's uh, behavior, uh, if when it is intestinal disease, also a significant proportion with penetrating disease, again, having implications in terms of uh, the um, advanced uh, therapies that would need to be uh, applied in, in resource limited uh, settings. And if, if you take into consideration what I've said about the fact that we are now going to move on to the phase of uh, increasing uh, prevalence, uh, we are going to run into serious problems in terms of uh, what we are able to do and the resources that are available to us. And then furthermore, you can see that in most of the countries represented in the study, uh, endoscopy was available. That is really encouraging that, that the people are, are, are have access to endoscopy. Of course, this data doesn't speak to the quality of endoscopy uh, uh, that is being done uh, uh, and, and so forth and competence, and, et cetera, especially when you, one is looking at uh, surveillance. Uh, for dysplasia. Um, and then some of the countries had access to histological uh, facilities, but you can see that a country like Mozambique did not have uh, any uh, histopathology services. And then imaging also was quite uh, variable, but a lot of the countries did not have access to CT, uh, MRE, uh, which, which is important, uh, particularly in Crohn's disease uh, in terms of diagnosis. And again, fecal culture protection is very expensive, is not readily available anywhere. And even in South Africa, you can see that uh, the uptake, whether it's because people just don't use it or whether it's because it's expensive and not available, I'm not sure, but you can see that the use of fecal cult protection is pretty low uh, in, in, in our setting. So this gives an idea of uh, resource uh, availability uh, across the continent. And you can, you can guess that in some other areas, maybe not represented in this registry, that the access to histology and, and imaging and fecal cult protection is particularly low. So another registry I just wanna tell you about, and I've just checked again on PubMed, the results of this have not yet been published, but this is a, a, a protocol that was submitted by uh, Dr. Katizira, who's based in Zimbabwe. He's a fellow that also trained here in our center. And he also, again, in an attempt to try and A, identify the cases and report them so that we do have data that is represented uh, from our continent, which I think is super important. And then Chris alluded to these two very high impact publications. I think Lancet is uh, ranks among the top four, five uh, biomedical uh, journals uh, in terms of impact factor. And uh, Jill again was asked uh, to, to do two papers. And the first one uh, described the epidemiology and risk factors and challenges uh, in diagnosis of IBD in, in our continent. 
And then the second paper was uh, challenges and proposal as to how we can um, uh, subvert the problems that we are having and increase our, uh, our diagnosis uh, of this condition uh, for the benefit of patients. So congratulations uh, to Joe for this. This is uh, really, um, really important uh, stuff and, and we harp on it, but that's because uh, you don't get uh, publications in these uh, journals uh, every day. Um, and then um, most of you would be aware of uh, Dr. David Epstein, who started uh, the IBD uh, Africa uh, website, and it has done exceptionally well in terms, originally it started off as a, as a, as a tool for collating data, uh, so for research, but it has actually evolved into a, a very, very important tool uh, in terms of education uh, for patients uh, and for advocacy, which uh, in terms of uh, access to medication, we, we, we really need uh, quite desperately. So here's another uh, platform, uh, that is trying to galvanize the doctors, the patients, uh, governments, uh, pharma, uh, in terms of access to therapy and the importance of, of, of uh, treating patients. But also, uh, more importantly, I think uh, it's, it's a tool for, for patients to understand their disease, uh, to have uh, support uh, with other patients uh, on their platform, and there are lots and lots of educational activities uh, that are going on. So, this is my final slide, I think. I think in terms of challenges and opportunities for us in Sub-Saharan Africa in, in IBD, I think we have a lot of biologically naive patients. So I think there's a lot of studies that could come out of this cohort of patients who have not been treated before and can understand uh, how the drugs work, how the drugs work in our, in our patients, et cetera, et cetera. We also now are, are accumulating patients who are biologically exposed. And so the complications, the interactions, uh, and, 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 and now the response of our patients uh, to, to these agents uh, is, is now something that we can start to report on because this data doesn't exist. And of course, unfortunately, traditionally, uh, only 1% of uh, patient uh, cohorts uh, in Africa are actually included uh, in the clinical trials uh, that go on in this study. And that's something that, that needs to change, but it will be very difficult to be incorporated into the fold if we ourselves don't have our own data and we ourselves don't understand the epidemiology of this disease in our patients. So it is important to report our own experiences. And then ed educational activity, I think is, is strong. And I think COVID uh, helped to actually bump this up so that we really can reach as many clinicians, non-gastroenterology clinicians as possible uh, so that um, they have the tools to be able to recognize this disease and diagnose it or at least refer patients uh, to centers uh, that can uh, do this work. The weaknesses I'm going to do together with the threats because they're similar. As I said, and I've been saying that diagnostic tools are limited uh, in, in most places, um, and then we don't have access to drugs. They're very, very expensive. Um, and then, as I said, we haven't generated enough of our own data and I think just systemically in Africa, we are challenged by the inadequate health systems and what can be done in centers and what can be offered to patients. And that can um, significantly limit what one can do uh, for the patients. We have an increasing burden of disease, as I've shown, in the setting of limited resources. But the other thing is that I think, um, you know, we, we tend to work in silos. I've shown you three different registries, one from the IBD Africa registry, then uh, Leon, Leone's uh, registry and Phoebe's registry. And I think if there's an opportunity or possibility for us to work together and, and, and collaborate and incorporate uh, the data that comes from these registries, then obviously we'll have a bigger data set and we'll have more that we can report on in terms of our patient populations. So, and I know that uh, David um, is in touch with Phoebe and uh, you know, trying to see how the two registries can actually start to talk to each other. But as I said, uh, the opportunities are immense and we really shouldn't let uh, this, these opportunities go to waste. We are seeing these patients. We can start to describe uh, these patients. Um, we need to really create our own neuroregional data. There's a question of whether genetics uh, in our setting would be different, uh, whether the microbiome uh, in, in uh, Africa is different than in other places and therefore would have implications for the disease expression and, and also uh, um, a response to therapy, uh, et cetera. And as I said, I think we need to collaborate with our registries, particularly in our context, the role of diet. You know, we have a lot of communities that are still living in rural areas, whether that diet uh, 
would be more likely to promote a less inflammatory phenotype uh, that would be more protective to disease is a question. The role of vitamin D has been reported. Uh, the whole point of the hygiene hypothesis and the role of helminths, whether those could be used uh, as a preventative measure uh, to, to reduce um, the development of autoimmune diseases, including uh, uh, IBD. And then there's very interesting data about uh, H, H, H. pylori in that patients um, or cohorts that have H. pylori tend to have a lower risk uh, of inflammatory bowel disease. Again, this speaks to the hygiene hypothesis and whether the um, um, co-infection with the uh, um, bacterial agents uh, or, or parasites modulate the immune response more towards a Th2 anti-inflammatory phenotype than a Th1 uh, phenotype. So I think the point I'm trying to make is that there's a lot that we can do in terms of descriptive data, um, but there's also a lot of translational uh, research opportunities uh, that just need to be grabbed. And then we really need to start to contribute to the body of work uh, globally. Uh, on the patients uh, that we're seeing. So with this, I'm happy to stop. Um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, or any Perhaps, uh, Meshika, um, thanks for that excellent update. Um, perhaps you can take questions at the end. That's perfect. Thank you, Chris. Okay, excellent. Um, so let's turn now to uh, Johannes Behanu from the uh, College of Health in Addis, University of Addis, to give us a, an Ethiopian uh, perspective. So welcome, Johannes. Thank you very much, Chris. Nice to meet you again. We have met in Addis a few years back. Um, my name is Johannes Brahano. I'm uh, a staff at Addis Ababa University. I'm a gastroenterologist. I've been working as a gastroenterologist for the past uh, nine years. Um, this is my first time in this platform, and I'm honored to be asked to present, and I hope my presentation will shed some light on the situation of IBD in my country, Ethiopia. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. Not yet, sorry. Would you like me to share from my side? I uh, let me try mine and okay. I think you should do that, maybe. Help me with that. Yeah. Can you do that from your side? Okay, um, for some reason my screen also froze. Let me just yeah. go fetch it again. I should have it now. Just, just my phone. Okay, can you see it now? 
Yeah, I can see it. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, All right. So can everybody see it? So yes. this is my my outline of my presentation. Uh, I was going to give some background, but thanks to my present my previous presenter, most of the, the things which I was supposed to talk have been discussed. So next slide, please. So this is as you have as previously mentioned, there is a significant paucity of data on IBD in Africa in general, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, because of the limited data, especially the incidence and prevalence of IBD in, in sub-Saharan Africa is largely unknown. Next slide, please. So the first report of IBD was reported in 1946 from Rwanda and Parma. I'm sure this is not a new news for, for most of you. Multiple systematic reviews have been done and uh, one identified around 34 publications in IBD in Africa and a limited number of patients being reported from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So one study I reviewed, only around 45 uh, patients was reported from a uh, study in, in Ghana. Next slide. Another review, uh, which was published in, in 2020, also revealed that the total number of reported cases in Sub-Saharan Africa was around 210, which is quite small. And an extensive systematic review published in 2017 also showed uh, the tried to evaluate uh, population-based studies in Africa. Only one study from Algeria was reported and then was reported from Sub-Saharan Africa. But generally, we know that uh, there is a trend of increase in the prevalence of IBD in Africa. Uh, next slide. So the aim of our study is to try to understand how prevalent uh, uh, IBD is in our setup. So we did a cross-sectional study, uh, which was conducted from January to December 2020, which is a, a span of about one year. All patients on follow-up at the Columbus Hospital, which is my hospital in the GI clinic with a diagnosis of IBD were eligible for the study. Next slide. So the inclusion criteria was patients in whom diagnosis of IBD was made by a gastroenterologist. The case definition we used is IBD diagnosis, uh, uh, diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis by a gastroenterologist based on suggestive endoscopic features in combination with Supportive histologic findings. We required both these findings to be there to uh, as a case definition of IBD. Next, please. So we ex excluded patients in whom significant information was missing, who were not accessible for interviews, uh, who did not undergo colonoscopy and biopsy. And whenever there is a doubtful diagnosis, we also excluded patients and, of course, uh, patients who refused to provide consent, consent were also excluded from the study. Next, please. So we used the Montreal classification as disease phenotyping for our study. Next, please. So the data was collected uh, from medical records and patient in interviews were also made by structured uh, questionnaires, specifically prepared for the purpose of this study. Next, please. So this is the inclusion flowchart for our study. During that study period, around 1,730 patients were on follow-up at our clinic, gastroenterology clinic at Addis University, and 140 patients with IBD were identified, but we had to exclude some of them. Eight of them were excluded due to doubtful diagnosis, and 30 patients were excluded due to incomplete data and totally 120 patients were included in, in this particular study. Next, thank you. So of the 102 patients uh, we identified with the diagnosis of IVD, around 71.5% of the patients had actually Crohn's disease, and around 28% had ulcerative colitis. The female patients accounted to around 57% of patients with IBD and the female to male ratio was 1.2 to 1 in patients with Crohn's disease and 1.6 to 1 in ulcerative colitis. Uh, 
And as you can see from uh, this study, the proportion of female patients showed no significant difference between the Crohn's disease and alternative colitis groups. Next. The mean age as diagnosis was around 28.3. And when we compared patients with Crohn's disease with ulcerative colitis, the mean age as diagnosis of Crohn's disease was lower than that of patients with ulcerative colitis. Next, please. So this is a tabular presentation of what I have just described. Uh, as you can see, the age the among the most, most patients with IBD were in the age group of 18 to 35, and there seems to be a significant difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease at, on the mean age, and Crohn's disease patients seem to be relatively, uh, were diagnosed at a relatively younger age as compared to ulcerative colitis patients. Next, please. So when we come to mean duration of illness, the mean duration of illness in patients with Crohn's disease was around 3.5 years. And it was somehow comparable with ulcerative colitis patients' average uh, years for before diagnosis or median duration of illness for patients with ulcerative colitis was around four. Chronic non-bloody diarrhea and perianal symptoms and uh, aphasia symptoms seem to be more significantly more common in patients with Crohn's disease. It is uh, unexpected type of symptomatology uh, given the uh, diagnosis. On the other hand, bloody diarrhea, erectile bleeding were significantly more common in ulcerative colitis. The incidence of extraintestinal manifestations in this study was around 16.7%. Uh, most of these patients actually had arthralgia as an extraintestinal manifestation. Next, please. So this is also an extension of the previous table. Most of the things are what I have said before. Next, please. Again, next, please. For the sake of time, I'm going to rush to the presentation. So cross these patients, according to the Montreal classification, we have identified that the iliocolonic type was more prevalent. Around 45% of patients with Crohn's actually had iliocolonic disease. And 34% of patients had ileal disease and 21% had isolated chronic disease. Uh, and upper gastrointestinal manifestations, this is based on symptomatology only. And uh, around 15.1% of patients had perianal involvement and 12.3% were complicated with fistula formation. When we come to ulcerative colitis, Left-sided colitis accounted for the majority of our patients with ulcerative colitis, around 77% had left-sided colitis, and proctitis was seen in 15% of patients, and pancolitis was actually the least common type of disease, and it accounted for 8% of our patients. Next, please. So this is the classification with this tabular presentation of what I've said on the Montreal classification goes for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Next slide. So when we come to treatment between patients in patients with chronic uh, uh, IBD, there was a statistically significant difference in the treatment between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease uh, concerning the use of 5-ASA and corticosteroids, as you can see. Uh, many patients with uh, ulcerative colitis use 5-ASA as compared to Crohn's disease patients. In our uh, study, only 6.8% 6, of patients with Crohn's disease used 5-ASA. Corticosteroid use, unexpectedly, we found out that almost all patients with ulcerative colitis took corticosteroids, but only 80% of patients with uh, Crohn's disease reported, 80 per, uh, reported use of corticosteroids, even as an initial treatment. This may be second due to the fact that many of our patients actually had surgery uh, for uh, acute abdomen before they, they were sent to our clinic from the surgical unit. And these patients were patients with Crohn's disease. And for this group of patients, uh, most of them were started on immunomodulators directly without starting corticosteroids. When we come to immunomodulator use, 
the use was relatively comparative, comparable between the two groups, Crohn's Crohn disease, or almost 89% of our patients were on azathioprine, and alternative colitis, or 72.4% were taking uh, azathioprine. Next, please. So one third of patients in the study had a history of one form of surgery with a rate of bowel resection being and colectomy being reported in 18.6% of patients. Patients with Crohn's disease showed significantly higher bowel resection rates uh, as compared to ulcerative colitis patients. Only 10%, 20.3% of patients with ulcerative colitis had undergone colectomy, while 19.1% of patients with Crohn's disease had surgery you know, on follow-up. Next, please. So this is also treatment course and use of different uh, immunomodulator steroids, which I have described before. Next slide. So this is also a tabular presentation of the different drugs which have been used for treatment of ulcerative colitis. I have been uh, talking about it in the previous slides. Next, please. Again, this is a tabular presentation of uh, the use of steroids, immunomodulators, 5PSA, in uh, the course of patients we have seen in the study. Next slide. Again, next slide. So when we come to discussion, to date in Sub-Saharan Africa, the total number of patients which have been at least in public reports reported was around 210, and our study has shown that a relatively higher number of patients were identified during our study. Next slide. So the result indicates that Crohn's disease is a dominant form of IBD in our setup with a ratio of around 2.5 to 1. And compared to other studies in Africa and other developed in developing countries where ulcerative colitis seems to be relatively common, Crohn's disease seems to be common in, in our study. However, studies from Ethiopian Jews who immigrated to Israel also showed that Crohn's disease seems to be a predominant phenotype in patients with IBD in, in uh, this group of patients. Next slide. So female to male ratio, which is comparable to other studies in North and Western Africa. Similarly, female predominance was observed in Crohn's disease patients. Uh, in other uh, studies, for example, in a study from Accra, females were the predominant patients with Crohn's disease. And two thirds of patients uh, in our study came from the capital. This may be because since the uh, hospital is located in Addis Ababa and access to medical care may not be easy for patients living outside of Addis. Next slide, please. So, Contrary to reports from Asian countries, the diagnosis of IBD in our study was made at an early uh, age. This is also true in some studies from Africa. Our patients were diagnosed at a younger age for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And as compared to, for example, studies from Egyptian and Ghanaian studies, they reported relatively higher age of diagnosis. Uh, similarly, the mean age of uh, patients with ulcerative colitis in this study was significantly higher than that of patients with Crohn's disease. Slide. Uh, in our study, the number of smokers uh, identified was relatively low, so it may be difficult to make any conclusion, but there was no significant uh, association between smoking and either alternative colitis or Crohn's disease. So the prevalence of smoking in our setup is relatively low. It is estimated to be less than 3%. And even in our study, only a few patients actually smoked, so it may be difficult to make any conclusion on association from this study. Next slide, please. Uh, when we come to family history of IBD, almost 8.6% of uh, patients with Crohn's disease had family with history of a similar illness. Uh, in some of them, it was a diagnosed Crohn's disease, but none of the patients which we encountered in during the study with ulcerative colitis reported family history of similar illnesses. However, a low rate of family history was also reported from studies in India, uh, than in Western countries, but a larger study is required to make a conclusion on uh, family uh, association with family history. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So higher proportion of patients with Crohn's disease in our study took anti-tubers plus drug as compared to ulcerative colitis. This is understandable given the uh, similar site of uh, involvement uh, with anti with TB and the epidemiology of the prevalence of tuberculosis in our setup. Most patients who presented had at least one to two years of symptoms before diagnosis. And this may be explained by lack of access to early medical care in Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide, please. So the study also revealed that the demographic pattern and the clinical picture of IBD are more or less the same with other developing countries. When we come to extent of ulcerative colitis in this disease, almost 77% had left-sided colitis. Some reports from India and other Asian countries reported pancolitis to be the commonest feature, but from the previous presentation as well, left-sided colitis seems to be more predominant in African studies. Next slide, please. For Crohn's disease, ileocolonic disease accounted for the majority of patients and from the, the present, present previous registry as well, it seems to coincide with the finding of the registry which is going on now. Approximately 26% of our patients had structuring disease and penetrating disease was reported in about 19% of uh, patients. Some studies in Asia reported higher prevalence of structuring and uh, fistulizing disease. Next slide. One or more extraintestinal symptoms were reported in more than half patients in a large uh, Indian study, but prevalence of uh, extraintestinal manifestations was relatively low in our setting. And most of the reports were actually arthralgia. And only one case of uh, skin manifestation was uh, identified in our setup. Powder uh, Magong Gangrinosum was identified in one patient with ulcerative colitis, the rest were arthritis. Next, please. So when we come to the clinical course uh, in patients with IBD, uh, almost 60% of our patients had uh, frequent remissions and relapses. This may be the, due to the uh, fact that most of them are kept on azathioprine and better drugs like biologics are not available in our setup. So frequent relapses seems to be more prevalent in our setting. In the present study, around 17.6% of patients discontinued their medication. And this is also expected, most likely it can be explained by the fact that most of these drugs, especially the drugs we use for maintenance are relatively expensive and they are not affordable for uh, long-term use in most of our patients. Thank you very much. Next uh, slide. Concerning initial therapy received at initial diagnosis, virtually all patients with Ulcerative colitis actually received corticosteroids. The 80% of patients who started uh, corticosteroids, as I said before, most likely it is second due to the fact that some of the patients were sent after surgical resection and they were not put on steroids as initial therapy. Next slide. Use of 5-ASA seems to be more prevalent in patients with ulcerative colitis and only a few patients used 5-ASA in Crohn's disease. This coincides with most societal guidelines, actually. None of the patients included uh, in our setting, in our study, received biologics, you know, given the fact that the biologics are not available uh, in our setup, and they are expensive for the majority of patients, which we offer them actually uh, as well. Next, please. Total bowel resection rate uh, was around 18.6% in our setting. Compared to reports from Western countries, it seems to be relatively low, but one explanation for this may be the lack of access to surgical care, especially for patients who live outside of uh, the capital. Next, please. So in conclusion, the study reported a relatively large number of patients with IBD now in Sub-Saharan Africa. Contrary to other African reports, Crohn's disease seems to be more predominant phenotype in, in our context. And with changes in lifestyle pattern, coupled with improvement in diagnostic services, we expect that more patients are going to be diagnosed with IBD in the future. And larger studies, uh, uh, including other centers, is also planned on our part. Next slide. So 
this is uh, what I have. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like any questions and comments. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Excellent, Johannes, um, to share this great study with us. And hopefully yeah. we, we'll see many more. Yeah. So um, there, there is a, so we start off with a question from Innocent. Um, so they, they, I mean, the striking features of your study really was the high incidence of Crohn's disease, the younger age of presentation, the higher surgical uh, resection rates, et cetera. But when you come to diagnosis and the high prevalence of uh, Crohn's disease, two factors, one, a question from Innocent, obviously in the background will always be TB in Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, these are the two infections, I think that, that we always worry, not worry about, but we got to consider when discussing um, etiology and pathogenesis. TB, we really discuss a lot. And I'm going to ask Masheka also about H. pylori infection because she's just published with Jill Watermeyer a very interesting review on perhaps interactions between H. pylori and inflammatory bowel disease. But can you tell us um, uh, whether you, you know, some of these patients with Crohn's disease might have had TB and did you, uh, were you happy with your histological um, uh, diagnoses? And you mentioned that, in fact, some of them had, in fact, empiric anti-tuberculosis therapy. So do you think perhaps TB confounded this uh, high incidence of uh, CD that you found? Of course, that is that is a factor which, which we, have, we have considered. And... Uh, one thing we have observed is even in those patients who have, who have had exposure to anti-TB, who have been treated for, for TB elitis, we have asked their response to treatment. Some of them had responded, but in the next six months, most of these patients had recurrence of symptoms. So the histologic uh, diagnosis of Crohn's disease, we have had some doubts in patients in whom uh, the possibility of TB is entertained based on endoscopic or coronoscopic findings, we actually start them on anti-TB and they are not included in this particular study. But generally, especially during first presentation, many of our patients are actually started on anti-TB. But most of these, the patients which we are included in this study are patients who have been, who have had established Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis based on histology, previous history of TB, and response to treatment. All right, so you're happy that you're not actually including some patients with TB. The second important question is that you've got a, an, an interesting demography in Ethiopia because you, you have an increased incidence of, uh, of Jews, uh, uh, which might have confounded this high incidence of CD. How many of your population group were Jewish? Well, Currently, most of the Jewish population have been re 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 relocated to, to Israel. Currently, we don't have that much Jews because they have been taken to Israel by, by a project. And uh, the previous, the, the one I mentioned is actually a study which was done in Israel on Jews who immigrated from, from Ethiopia. And? And it shows that Crohn's disease seems to be more prevalent than ulcerative colitis, even in that population. But currently, we don't have many Jews in Ethiopia. Okay, so these are the so-called falashes, which I think is a derogatory yeah. term now, but yeah, displaced yeah. Jews, Black Jews of Ethiopia. Sure. All right, and um, perhaps you could ask Mesheko, uh, any... any um, Thoughts on uh, whether H. pylori plays a role on uh, inflammatory bowel disease in sub-Saharan Africa? Look, I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, and it needs to be studied. But uh, in the paper that we wrote, uh, there was a meta-analysis of about 40 studies. So that's not a little study. Um, and there it was uh, shown that there was a 57% uh, reduction in uh, IBD in patients that were shown to have H. pylori infection. And the hypothesis really is that, as we know, H. pylori readily colonizes the stomach mucosa, happily lives with the acid. And so it's able actually to induce um, a tolerant sort of uh, immune uh, reaction. So it induces uh, tolerant uh, dendritic cells. It actually um, upregulates the Th1, Th17 response, which dampens down the immune response and allows it to colonize and exist 
and also reduce the autoimmunity that comes from uh, IBD. So, uh, so, and this was in, 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 in um, human studies and also it has been shown in, in animal studies uh, that uh, it, it, H. pylori tends to do that. And I think, uh, I don't know if Judy's on, but it all has to do with the hygiene hypothesis. The cleaner we are and, and, and the less exposed we are to pathogens, the more the risk of developing autoimmunity. And hence, I think for us going forward, it is something to explore about whether giving children uh, helmets either in the form of some uh, solution or something, or at least not treating, treating uh, infections and deworming might actually be preventative. Ah, welcome, Jill. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, lots of Wi-Fi problems here. I think load shedding is causing chaos here. Uh, sorry. Even though it's not load shedding now. But I did manage to uh, listen to Johannes's excellent presentation. Um, so just one thing about the worms. We did a study um, in collaboration with uh, colleagues from the John Hopkins, which showed that self-reported worm infestation in childhood was associated with a 14-fold reduction in the risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease down the line. And there were, of course, um, some studies that was all the rage, because Brian Michiko will remember, about 10, 15 years ago, using tracheosuus as a possible treatment for IBD. That's sort of fallen down the wayside, but I think the worm thing is very real. And you know, these days, if a child, I think Tim's on here, if a child so much as has a vague GIT complaint, they get um, uh, dewormed. And I know that there are programs across Sub-Saharan Africa where they are, uh, you know, routinely deworming children. Maybe Johannes would like to <clears throat> tell us about the experience in Ethiopia there. But that might be another reason why we're starting to see an, uh, an increase in, in IBD in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, there were different projects in, you know, in, in Ethiopia as well to we, we tried to dewarm children, especially school age children. And yeah. uh, it's very difficult to say whether it has contributed to the prevalence of IBD, but we are seeing a boom of patients with uh, alternative colitis Crohn's disease. There may be a possibility of contribution, but of course, as you know, it may need a detailed evaluation. But we have a project by the Ministry of Health and patient with students, uh, child, with children are given uh, dewarming as, as a program that might have contributed. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to take over, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very out of the loop. Are we going to end off now? I don't know if there are any other questions or, or, or comments. Um, I, I have a quick question for Johannes. Thank you so much for presenting your data. I mean, I think this platform is perfect for, for this sort of thing. Mm. And congratulations on the work that you do, because it is adding evidence to what we're dealing with, because we all think UC is more common than Crohn's disease, but your data clearly shows that predominance amongst the other risk factors and the phenotypic uh, things that you presented. Um, my question is, have you been in touch with Phoebe? Are you contributing to her registry? And would you be open to that? Of course, of course, I have been part of that. We had had some problems with the network. We have had, we have many patients to register, but I didn't manage to register a patient yet, but I am. I have already registered and I'm part of it. That's fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jill, maybe I'll close. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I'm a bit <laughs> no, look, we had 100, over 150 registrations. So it just shows you the interest, or perhaps it's the beginning of the year and everyone's fresh yeah, yeah. enthusiastic. Fresh. But I do think, Jill and Masheko, you've really raised awareness. And they really, this, this is what these platforms are about. And to share these wonderful uh, work that um, Johannes and others are doing. So thank you very much, Johannes. It's, it's really thank great you. to thank see you again and to... To, to share your work with yeah. us. So thanks to all the presenters and, and to the sponsors and to Cheryl, Valentine and Karen Fenton who do all the logistics. Um, and so next week um, we are uh, we, we're starting um, our first pathology session and it will be devoted to cases of hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is um, these are cases which will be presented from the pathological, histopathological point of view, but we're now adding radiology as well to the clinico-histopathological correlation. So I hope you, you'll join us and uh, it will be chaired by, um, well, Bilal will be substitute and then presented by Martin Hale from this. So with that, thank you very much, Masheko. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Jill, for coming. It's always a relief when I see you. <laughs> and uh, good night, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday at 4.30.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And happy new year. <laughs> and happy new year, Christian. Thank you. Okay. Nice to see you always. Okay. Yeah. And Hannes, I'm looking forward to your publication when it's formally published. Thank you. Thank you. We will we'll, we'll share it. Thank you very much. Great. Excellent. All right. Bye. Bye.